Hi, Davida and Sarah. Um, for all of you that are watching this, do you remember that scene in The Matrix where Morpheus asks, do you think that's air you're breathing? Well, Davida represents a company that can tell you actually what else you're inhaling in your oxygen. Meanwhile, Grow Intelligence, uh, and Sarah has founded that firm, they can help companies future-proof their supply chains. Welcome, both of you. Davida, could you go ahead and tell me a little bit about yourself and your company? Yeah, of course. Um, my uh, my name is Davida Herzl, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Acoma. Um, we are a public benefit corporation, um, and we've introduced an entirely new way to measure air pollution and greenhouse gases um, and analyze that data um, uh, block by block at the scale of entire metropolitan regions and uh, and around the world. Um, and we were filled, we were founded um, to fill a really critical gap in hyper-local environmental data. Um, there's two things that we don't really understand very well today. And it's kind of shocking when you think about the scale of the climate challenge and the hard work that needs to be done in communities around the world. Uh, but today we don't have the measurement infrastructure to understand two really critical things. One, where are emissions coming from? And two, who are they impacting? And so um, that is the gap that ACOMA was founded to fill. Today, um, uh, 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 we're uh, uh, deploying our, uh, sensor tech, our network, uh, sensor networks around the world um, and our fleet of vehicles, um, uh, our mobile network that does this uh, around the planet um, is the world's largest uh, mobile environmental sensor network. Um, and uh, our customers are using that data uh, to uh, shape climate action plans that reduce emissions, uh, protect public health and advance environmental justice all at the same time. Got it. Sarah, tell me a little about, about Grow Intelligence. Yeah, of course, Grow Intelligence is a company I founded in, in 2014. And, you know, it's really a, a company that's dedicated to telling the story of what on earth is going on um, in, in sort of a, in, in sort of both a literal way, um, as in sort of our environment and, and stories about our environment and, and data, sharing data about our environment, but really, Sort of the connectivity right so it's a it's it's a company it's an ai company that we built that is really focused on illuminating the interrelationships that exist between our earth's ecology and our human economy and sort of helping people understand what the big picture of that is and then how do you actually act on the small details around that right so and and so what we've done is We've taken sort of large disparate data sets um, that exist around the world around these topics. And we have standardized that data in such a way that we can start to give and deliver very honest answers around things uh, surrounding climate change and the effects that it's gonna have on very specific industries, ranging from agriculture to our core infrastructure, to energy, to real estate, et cetera but also using that data that we have in the system to model things like the forecasting of the supply of food products around the world or the demand, right? And so this is, this is like, and this is what sort of I say is the agriculture sits at the intersection of our Earth's ecology and our human economy in many different ways. Like to understand food and food production, you are literally studying ecology and the Earth and to understand, um, demand it's about humans you and i and what we consume and that's much more of an economic discussion and this tension between the two is sort of at the nexus of a lot of humanity's challenges and so we've built a uh, a platform that you know ingests hundreds of trillions of data points around the world to start telling <coughs> these real-time stories and start providing honest answers around critical questions facing both food security and, and climate change around the world. Let's um, let's get down to a little bit of a certain level of granularity. And this question is directed to both of you. But as a result of your work, um, have you seen your clients, such as governments or companies, uh, make decisions that actually help mitigate uh, or, or eventually avert climate change, which is which is the goal, hopefully? What would you say? Let's start with uh, Davida. Yeah. So, Akama data is uh, is the is a is the backbone for um, a new 
an emerging uh, data-driven model for very highly localized community-centric emissions reductions. So if, you know, if I'm a government and I need to deploy a limited set of, of funding into emissions reductions in a city or in a community, I need to have data available to me to drive that decision making. Where, where are those emissions coming from? And, uh, and, and where, where uh, uh, are those emissions being most harmful to public health? And so, um, and this framework, this approach is actually getting baked into legislation across the country. In the United States, we've seen state of California, state of New York, state of New Jersey, um, now integrating this, this model um, for localized emissions reductions work um, uh, and, and the need for that highly localized data. And so we've been involved in a number of you know, major large scale um, efforts with government agencies, city and county governments, uh, businesses, environmental justice organizations that are using our data to understand um, where are hotspots designing interventions that often you know, include everything from transportation policy to you know, where to invest vegetative in vegetative corridors, um, and then using that data to measure ROI. Are we having an impact on actually reducing those emissions um, and, and reducing exposure? Um, and, you know, one of the you know, most significant examples at the highly localized uh, level some really groundbreaking work we've done um, with environmental justice leaders here in the state of California, um, in particular the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, that's building out this model for how you really, um, really localize uh, uh, and use data uh, to drive um, accelerated climate action and very effective deployment of investments in emissions reductions. Um, and you know, in West Oakland, as an example, you know, our data was used in a plan you know, that had nearly 100 different interventions, including everything from rezoning uh, to transitioning uh, the port towards electrification, um, targeted incentives for um, cleaner and no emissions trucks, um, improved enforcement of emissions regulations, urban greening, um, and even public education. So data has uh, an incredibly powerful role to play um, as we take on um, you know, bold climate action over the next several years here. Now, I know I framed my question around um, mitigating climate change, but you bring up once again, this important point of actually what people are breathing in their health. Um, and so you've actually been able to provide some of these local um, governments with data about what's in the air in very, in very mm -hmm. sort of kind of smaller, uh, smaller areas. Because uh, my, my sense is, from what I've understood, is that usually um, local or, or federal governments, they have a sense of what the national emissions are, but there's not necessarily any information on a local level. Right. And correct. And, and the science has shown that um, and the reason that this kind of localized data is so important is that you're right today you know we understand air pollution sort of at a regional scale um, uh, just as an example in the city of san francisco there's one official monitoring station for the entire city uh, and that's you know that that uh, uh, and we have a high density of sensors here official sensors versus other parts of the country in the world where there's sometimes no data and when it comes to greenhouse gases that have the same source um, uh, often as air pollutants, there's even less infrastructure. Um, but our science has shown that pollution actually varies block to block. So where you live matters. And, um, and it can vary um, uh, at extreme levels up to 800% differences from one block to the next. Uh, and so what our data does is it really shines a light on exactly where what those hotspots look like at the local level and can tell you, depending on where you live, what uh, level of pollutants you're likely to be more exposed to. Interesting. Is any of that data made available once you have concluded your work? Uh, is that so that, you know, like I could zoom in on my neighborhood <laughs> just to, just just out of curiosity for, and for the people I'm sure they're thinking the same thing. Could I check out my neighborhood and see what's going on with the air there? Yeah, so the way that our, our model works, um, we, you know, we, we provide continuous um, measurement over time. 
Uh, and we have a professional um, uh, analytical tool, um, a web-based software tool that we make available to our customers um, that brings our data together alongside contextual data about the built environment, about land use. Um, uh, and then we're uh, uh, beta testing right now, actually in partnership with a number of um, local leaders, uh, tools that enable any member of the public to put in their address and understand um, what their exposure is at their specific that specific address. So um, we're we're testing that right now and, and excited to make that more broadly available later this year. Should be really interesting, Sarah. Now, you know, looking at Grow Intelligence, um, it, uh, it 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 seems like an amazing undertaking to really basically scrutinize the supply chain. Of, of a company. So where do you feel, you know, in, in, in the different projects and the different clients you've had, where you've actually given them enough information for them to take some sort of concrete steps to ameliorate or, or mitigate global warming? So, I mean, um, the first thing I'd like to, to clarify a little bit is there's you know, two sides to the, the, the climate change equation, right? One is um, emissions. Um, and, and sort of um, CO2 and CO2 related emissions um, that David is talking about in terms of capturing that data, reducing that the CO2, CO2 related emissions um, to, uh, to, to sort of avert changes in climate, right? So emissions lead to actual changes in climate, meaning that CO2 change leads to changes in temperature, rainfall, hurricane risk, earthquake, you know, all of the, all of all of the above. You know. Now, me. what happens is that the decisions we made 20, 30 years ago on emissions are what we're paying for today in terms of climate change, right? So there's some set of actions that are being taken, which is around how do we reduce our carbon footprint over sort of the next five, 10, 20 years to avert complete another disaster post 2050. There's a second part of it, which is we've already made a lot of mistakes and we're still going to pay the price regardless of the action we take today or tomorrow for the mistakes we have made as society over the next 20 to 30 years. And those mistakes are getting costlier and costlier by the year through increased volatility in sort of climate outcomes, physical outcomes. GROW is focused on that side of the climate conversation. We're focused on how do we mitigate the physical risks associated with climate change, recognizing that today and every year, we're, that cost is going up for businesses, it's going up for governments, it's going up for individuals. And so how we're sort of participating and, and how we work with you know, our, 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 our customers, which is always about tangible outcomes, um, is is really very much around the measurement of that physical risk, right? So how is the climate shift going to occur and what's that going to be to the bottom line of my business or how is that going to impact my food supply in the nation? And how do I mitigate for that? That means diversifying your supply chain. So if we work with food companies, for example, that are saying, okay, we're going to invest in our future supply chains. And we've selected the foods we want to sort of expand our presence in. But what parts of the world should we be investing in supply chains, recognizing that not every part of the world is going to be suitable for growing every type of food? So we use our data and the algorithms in our product, for example, to rank every region in the world for suitability and help sort of optimize what that supply chain looks like in the future, right? The second is, how do you understand short-term disruptions to businesses? And then how do you mitigate that risk? Because again, if you have unprecedented floods or unprecedented drought in regions in the world that are major food growing regions, which is happening in places like the US, which is the world's real bread basket, and that volatility is increasing, how do you better sort of predict what the outcome of that is so that sort of the redistribution of supply chains, even in the short term, can occur in a much more optimized way and there is less loss in the system, right? And so we're very much sort of focused on the physical effects of climate change versus the change in behavior to reduce emissions, because both are gonna to have to simultaneously happen for it to sort of afford it as humanity. Although as you, as you made in your point, some of these actions to actually mitigate the physical risks can have uh, knock-on effects on, on emissions going forward. 
Oh, absolutely, right. And, and, and some of the ways we do that is we help, for example, um, companies look at where all of their physical assets, all the buildings they own are, and identify our, we, we use basically long range climate forecasts all the way out to 2100 to get a sense of which regions are gonna be exposed, where, where in the world are you gonna be most exposed to the highest increase in temperature, for example, or the biggest drops in temperature in the winter and the reason that uh, Sarah winter, off the off the top of your head do you know where that where, where that is those two polar opposites when where are we going to see the biggest <laughs> drop in temperature just out of curiosity no but I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a, an even more stark example versus where in the world versus where not if you look at the state of Texas okay and you look at eastern Texas eastern Texas by 2050 will experience maybe a 1.2 degrees Celsius increase in temperature Western Texas will increase by five and a half degrees Celsius. So you don't have to, the, the thing is there's not a specific country in the world, right? Even within a specific country or a specific state, you can have highly variable outcomes. And this is why the specific location of where that asset is matters because the experience of a hotel operator in the same country can be wildly different based off where their hotels are based. And their biggest carbon footprint comes from heating or cooling requirements. And so knowing which ones to retrofit first to be more solar, for example, versus less um, you know, um, fuel, or fuel oil or coal, et cetera, is a really important decision because retrofitting every single one of your buildings is a really expensive set of decisions. Of so knowing which ones to retrofit first to reduce your carbon out, you know, footprint for the long run also matters. Really quickly, on that one on that note now so how's business sarah you know um are your are your in, are investors interested in in your company are our clients calling you especially now with the pandemic which has sort of kind of uncovered all these social and environmental inequities what's happening i i've, I've written about banks that are now future proofing or or, or climate change proofing their entire um portfolio billions of dollars so what's happening is your phone ringing off the hook um very busy we're growing very fast um i mean we like i said we're working on two critical issues one food security one climate the other one climate change um climate change space is sort of really just picking up momentum now in terms of also the us re-entering things like the paris agreement right um cop 26 so there's just lots of top of mind um, discussions for financial institutions, companies around sort of what they do. And, and so we're in the process of launching new, uh, a whole new asset class around climate and climate change. And then obviously disruptions to our food systems has, has been a big, big theme over the past year. So we just closed an $85 million Series B round in December to sort of accelerate our growth and to sort of keep up with the amount of growth we're experiencing. Um, and so, yes, we're very busy. Um, but you know, investors being interested without sort of the the customer momentum is not interesting as as much as like are we making the impact we seek to make and we're making more of an impact every day. Davida, um, how's business? Yeah, um, twenty, I think you know, twenty twenty was a was a was accelerated a lot of trends, um, and I think uh, uh, you know we closed our Series B at the end of last year. Um, climate change uh, is now, uh, uh, I think the connection between climate change and environmental justice is central to the way that um, climate uh, policy is coming together at the federal level. Um, 2020 really shed a light, as you were saying, Nyanda, on, um, on, on uh, inequities across our economy. Um, and in particular, with the connection um, that uh, uh, you know, there's a major uh, set of studies last year that showed that if you had been exposed to air pollution during your lifetime, um, that you were more likely to die from COVID-19. Um, and because of the disproportionate experience of air pollution across communities of color, um, it just adds cumulative risk um, for the um, for those communities. And so. Um, our data plays a very important role in, in being able to direct and guide um, investments at the local level and everything from infrastructure um, uh, to you know, deployment of, of incentives. And so 
right now our challenge is um is just saying uh, uh saying saying no because there is so much um coming our way at this moment um and an incredible amount of growth um ahead as this data-driven approach you know you're seeing a convergence of not only sort of a larger awareness about these issues but convergence of increased regulation um increased accountability from the markets on industry the growth of esg um uh, and the recognition broadly that climate risk is financial risk and that where it hits home is at this human dimension and so it's put us um in a really exciting um uh on a really exciting growth trajectory and one of the reasons that we raised um our 40 million dollar series b um last year we brought in um some you know really spectacular partners like the microsoft innovation uh, climate innovation fund um uh, other corporate partners like bosch uh, but also uh, folks like uh, uh, existing investors that doubled down on the company like social capital um, and others so um yeah kind of an incredible incredible moment um and we're you know very excited about really delivering on our on our mission and um and extraordinary um uh, financial results Thank you both. Uh, that was uh, really, really, really interesting to hear. And uh, I look forward to watching uh, both of these companies and your mission. Thank you so much.